Great, welcome. Well, I'm gonna um, uh, share my screen. My thought for our time together was um, to start with uh, sharing with you all kind of the coordinated enrollment um, vision as laid out through the implementation plan. Um, walk through uh, some of the sections of that plan um, and then um, ask you all if we can uh, have a bit of a dialogue around um, your thoughts on um, your role, um, areas uh, that you see um, as excitements, uh, challenges, or barriers there, um, and we'll be doing that in um, small breakout groups um, so we have a time to really hear from everyone and then report out afterwards. Um, so for right now, I will go ahead and share my screen here. Just as soon as that becomes available to me. Okay. All right, are you all able to see the slide? Okay, cool, I see a thumbs up, thank you so much. Wonderful, so um, just to kick, kick us off right here, um, starting with, uh, with what is coordinated enrollment? Uh, so have a statement there, coordinated enrollment helps to ensure that all families are supported to make informed choice about the care and education of their child through a simplified and coordinated process. Through coordinated enrollment, families access publicly funded early care and education programs in their communities that are responsive to families' needs and preferences and that experience full enrollment. This key strategy is facilitated by early learning hubs in communities and is inclusive of early childhood partners, programs, and systems in service of building an aligned, family-centered, and coordinated early learning system. And I'm going to ask because the if there are things that show up in the chat, I will ask one of my ELD colleagues to let me know um, as I go. There's a few too many things on the driving side of this <laughs> screen. Um, getting more deeply uh, into kind of three components around coordinated enrollment. Um, uh, first and foremost, coordinated enrollment is a family centered strategy. Um, we know that children's development is supported and enhanced when they are raised in healthy, stable, attached, and empowered families who can engage them in high-quality early learning experiences, um, and when families are informed of and can choose the opportunities and supports that help them thrive. Um, we see coordinated enrollment as a way of doing this. Um, and is also rooted in equity, uh, centering children and families who experience chronic and persistent opportunity and access gaps due to their income, race, or zip code, um, and creating intentional policies and practices that address their needs. So you'll see a lot of alignment with many of our goals around Raise Up Oregon, um, particularly around access to the early learning system, um, borne out through that coordinated enrollment, family-centered strategy portion. Coordinated enrollment is a systems building strategy. Um, so through coordinated enrollment, um, we collect information about families' needs and preferences to connect them to available slots and services, and also to appropriately place slots and services within communities so that we can maximize enrollment in state-funded or publicly funded programs. Um, believe when families' needs and preferences for early care and education are used to inform decision making at all levels, the early learning system moves closer to being aligned, coordinated, and family centered. And then as we all know, um, coordinated enrollment is a collaboration focused strategy. Um, we know in our current public funding um, or financing and supply landscape, no single early care and education program or provider can serve all families and prepare all children for kindergarten. So successfully implementing coordinated enrollment includes actively reaching out to and consistently collaborating with publicly funded ECE programs, um, including Head Start, OPK, Preschool Promise, Baby Promise, um, our K-12 programs, uh, Early Intervention, Early Childhood Special Education, 
um, and that it's really uh, important and um, critical that we develop shared understanding of processes, um, infrastructure, and capacity in place in community that can um, be built upon um, or leveraged to support opportunities and access for all eligible families. So this um, next slide should be fairly familiar to all of you. Uh, when we're talking about coordinated enrollment, we typically operationalize what we mean within three areas of community work that's related to the enrollment process for publicly funded ECE programs. We have our marketing outreach recruitment, we have eligibility determination and programming, uh, and then selection and placement. And encircling this all um, is a real commitment towards um, continuous quality improvement, so use of data, um, reflection, and evaluation on our processes, um, and so we can continue to improve them. Implementation across these areas um, kind of span a continuum ranging from partner organizations starting to communicate to each other about how to um, market as a single entity, for example, um, and then also uh, can span towards uh, partner organizations and communities kind of fully coordinating across all three buckets. So we know there's a phased um, and continual approach uh, to the work that we are doing together. And supporting that, we are taking a phased approach to moving through our coordinated enrollment implementation over the next four program years. So our current year, 21-22, is focused on deepening local partnerships, um, on uh, community planning around recruitment, um, around interest forms or referrals, um, and on aligning enrollment timelines where possible. Um, we've also, as you know, begun a self-assessment uh, process um, and are um, also working on a coordinated enrollment plan um, to be completed at the end of this program year or for, for the next program year. This next slide talks about some of the coordinated enrollment key activities. So um, if you uh, recall the coordinated enrollment implementation plan, we've taken out kind of just the activity description and then early learning hub role and timeline from that chart. But you'll recall the chart has um, also the ELD role, the state role, um, Head Start OPK and CCRNR roles as well along this. Um, we uh, really try to follow an annual schedule or we're trying to move towards this annual schedule so that we align with the timing families need to have um, in order to have enough information about the variety of programs and providers available to them so that they can make that informed choice about the care and education of their child. Um, also, so we can you know, prepare you all um, as uh, ELD's regional partners uh, to be successful in planning for um, planning for these processes and uh, supporting providers to be successful in publicly funded programs, um, as well as convening your partners and making that plan. Um, this is big systems change um, and a real community undertaking. Um, we know that each system partner has expertise and a real critical role to play in this succeeding for children and families. Um, so coordination is really um, focused around partnerships, um, does not mean, you know, any one entity uh, can or is expected to accomplish all this work without those community partnerships. Um, I think what uh, is um, shining through here um, is, you know, as early learning hubs, um, have a real central role as um, systems conveners of, of partners, um, a real renewed focus on convening partners to create a plan that can be implemented together. Um, and that in addition to placing families in the available slots according to families choice, um, we need to have a, a cyclical way to understand family needs and preferences um, and how they can better inform how we at ELD disperse or allocate slots across communities. So in programs and provider types that meet those priority population families needs and preferences as well. So I hope what you see reflected through this is really um, the goal of an annual process that does both meet um, and help uh, place families with 
what is available currently and also um, seek to understand and provide more family input into where slots and programs um, and services are available in communities so that we move closer to um, serving priority populations with what they're telling us about their needs and preferences. I'm going to take just a quick sip uh, here, but I wonder um, if there are any reflections um, on, on these key activities, on the sort of um, hub role around those um, that I can respond to or can hear about at this time. Hey, Anne, I have a question. Um, I, I appreciate having this laid out this way. I'm looking down the timeline and I think the part I, I need some help understanding is uh, um, let's see, by December 1st, we've made requests for slots. And then by January 15th, we find out what those slots are. But I think what I'm looking for is a way in which our community can, can um, request, like, like we need slots in the Somali community, just for lack of a better, and, and so to me, that request would affect how the whole selection process happens for sites. So I, I, I don't see, I can't quite figure out how this fits in. Like, is it just that we request the number of slots and you tell us here you get this number, but I want my community to be able to say, um, you know, we need slots in East County. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't see how this fits with that process, but I, it probably does. I just don't get it yet. Nope, I think I think you're you're exactly on that. And Molly, I too want you to be able to tell <laughs> tell us you want slots in East County and you want Somali um, speaking providers in our publicly funded programming. Um, I, I think where um, we're working on that is really how can we take what we know from the EC sector planning, and you know, of course, those like grids that everyone put together around priority populations, and then what particularly those populations need from publicly funded early care and education and trying to get to that level of detail in a slot allocation request that's not just a number of slots for the whole region um, or community, but that is, you know, specific and responsive to those priority populations. So we are trying to, um, to tie those things more directly than I think they were the 2020 time around um, to be able to you know, know that you and obviously partners like CCRNR know so much about the capacity of providers in the region in addition to the family's um, uh, needs and preferences that really, is there a way we can stitch those together, you know, from a community request um, space um, rather than, than trying to kind of do a little more remotely. Um, so yeah. Is, yeah, there is a big desire to have really specific information about how slots should be allocated and to which providers meeting certain populations um, needs and preferences. I, I, I'm glad to hear that. I, I don't see it reflected in this, um, what's on the screen. That's the part that I, I, I worry about, that I understand good intent. I, I, I don't see and it makes it really hard, I'll just be super honest, it makes it really hard for me to go to my colleagues and say, um, this sector plan that I'm asking you to do is really valid. Um, it's been used because it's really hard to build local collaboration when that, that, um, that piece of the process where what we say that we, yeah, we just don't have any power and that part just drives me crazy. So I, I appreciate the intent. Um, I, I'm looking for action, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Molly, Molly. What would the plan say that would that would prove to the community that this is how it's going to that the sector plan will be used to determine this? Well, I, I think it, this plan would be connected with uh, recruitment and identification of providers, and that um, and that that identification of providers for that will match up with the sector plan would also be tied with, um, and this is how those providers will be supported. Like, like 
in, in my world, at least, and I would love for other folks to weigh in, um, we don't separate out co coordinated enrollment from the other aspects of the provision of services. So um, it, I, I think for me to be able to, boy, I'm being really honest here, for me to be able to be um, a reliable representative of the state who's running this program, uh, uh, I just, uh, yeah. I, I need to be able to rely, I need to be able to convey that this is a legit product and that um, and that it's coordinated at the state level and it hasn't felt that way. And it just keeps undermining um, trust over and over again. So um, maybe I'm just feeling a little raw from some recent experiences we've had in our county, but it, 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 it yeah. For us, the state has been the hardest partner, and not not you guys personally, but just the state system of um, lack of communication. It's it's lack of coordination of just like this very thing has has just made it so hard, um, and and so hard to go back out there over and over again and say, be lead the charge for preschool promise because it just. We have angry providers. It's just, it just has not been um, that really high quality thing I want to represent. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> so thank you, Molly. I, I'm, I, what I'm not seeing now, based on this conversation, is the the mechanism where entities like our Head Start OPK providers, when and where are they applying for, I mean, are you guys going to be using an RFA process? I'm, I'm not really, which is my assumption that it would be an RFA process, but now hearing this conversation, seeing the compressed timeline, I'm curious about that. Um, and then, I mean, is, is the ELD then going to take our, our, ECE sector plans, and is that going to be the guiding document for how contracts are made into the community? Yeah, I think um, I think the intent is that we're we're um, using, and I see I see how it's not really reflective with the RFA in this um, in this table here. We would be using the slot allocation request um, to make decisions on the RFA um, responses that come in. I think, you know, I, I wanna acknowledge like this key activities is like the when fully implemented running, like we may follow this annual timeline. And I think when, um, what I hear is like, we need to be in really close dialogue about what that um, timeline and how close we get to this timeline when it comes to our expansion for, you know, upcoming um, program year. Um, because I think there is um, a desire to move closer to this, but I think with um, with those moving pieces, with what an RFA looks like, um, I, I think we need to um, be able to share with you all, you know, where and how this um, this fits in with the RFA um, for at least for preschool promise. Excuse me. Um, and then, you know, how does this be? You know, how does this really give and and reflect? Um, the intent that uh, that we can we can use community voice in a in a different and more robust way. Um, so I, I hear you there. This isn't this is the very bare bones. And I think when it comes to how it looks in practice for this next expansion, um, we need to we need to get more um, and uh, more to you, and then also to be able to start really talking about what this looks like in practice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I, I think also, I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about preschool promise and Head Start slash OPK, right? That, and that, I think that is where we're all starting with that frame of mind. And this takes into account a whole lot more than just those two, three programs. I mean, this talks about early intervention, early childhood special education, which is a key partner, but hasn't been, you know, to think about doing enrollment for EIECSE, that like 
it kind of like blows my mind, <laughs> like, you know, right. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, it's, it, and then also our school systems and all, all key critical parts. Um, I think it's getting, getting the vision of what coordinated enrollment is and then defining as it relates by those different program and partner types Oh my, that's going to that's going to take a lot of time for us to be able to really articulate how do those really work together? Um, and are we is it really the intention that families are applying for those various programs and then we're placing them? Um, that's a that's a that's that's a much bigger ball of wax. Absolutely, absolutely, Lisa. And I do like I want to highlight, you know, while we're we're talking coordination, you know, we're not necessarily talking centralization, right? So some of this, I think, and the focus around those partnerships really is to say like, you know, do we know in community, like how those enrollments work and how might they, you know, work more smoothly for families, but it is not the intent that, you know, you or hub staff, you know, is alone, you know, responsible or doing all these things. That's, that's not, Part of it, I think it is to say like, what can communities come to together to um, think about combining or think about coordinating, you know, um, with a family experience in mind, what an enrollment process could look like. So um, not the intent that we centralize um, other than to say, you know, it's, it's um, through kind of that coordinated community partnership work that we're really interested in driving towards. So you're suggesting it's more of a kind of a referral. Pro I mean, it for lack of, of it, I mean, we're not we're not enrolling kids in EIECSE, right? But we are very knowledgeable of the various um, ways that EIECSE shows up in our communities and making sure that we've got those appropriate back and forth sharing information. Um, where do we need more of those resources in a variety of different communities? Yeah, that may be that may be the way it, it shows up, right? Really, really um, intending this to be very like regionally specific, based on the programs, the partners um, that that you all have, and what makes sense for families in in your region. Um, that's really the the goals around um, bringing. Uh, the con or like the convening factor of um, coordinated enrollment is really around the common understandings, shared, you know, um, either referral or, you know, shared understanding of what might happen if families, you know, present or interested in different programs um, and how they can be more smoothly sort of um, directed where, where they need to go um, or where they'd like to go. Okay. And in our in the South Central region, we've really had a, a really close partnership and, you know, we work really as a great team with our ECSE and um, what we do is part of our, you know, part of our MOU and our release of information is that all of our class lists get shared with our ECSE group so that they can ensure that anybody that may not have marked that they are on an IFSP um, they, they can definitely make sure they're receiving services where they're at, as well as, you know, help coach the parents around what resources may be needed and meet with the providers so they can provide resources that way. And so really sharing the class lists and then through Community Uplift, being able to provide the referral to ECSE if the child needs to um, from any one of our programs that we partner with um, is is really how we've overcome the ECSE and really you know partnered with that group to to make sure that they're a, a working partner with us through the whole journey. Um, so that's been that's how it's been handled in our region. Yeah, thank you for that, Athena. I think key to this too is being able to share across you know what's working and then you know, have you all as, as of course, like those closest to partnership to families in your regions saying, oh, okay, I'm, I'm hearing from this. Would that work for my community? Would that work for, you know, the way my process is, is working? So I want to continue to find those spaces too, to be able to share where things 
have gone out or where things have been tried and they were successful or um, be able to create those opportunities um, for you all too to do that. Thank you. Yep. And we've got a couple um, questions, comments in the chat box. I'll just kind of direct you to. So one question is when would the year's enrollment manual and forms come out? Those items coming out in early time impacts the possibility of doing other things on time, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think this isn't reflected there, but for Preschool Promise um, Enrollment Manual Forms update, um, I've um, been working with program colleagues to say like, how do we get this so that we're on a timeline where you can successfully make the plan um, of how to coordinate it enrollment with, how to coordinate enrollment um, uh, with having those pieces in place. So looking towards that like March timeline, I'm trying to get things to you earlier. Thank you. And then um, uh, a comment, just wondering if it's feasible to have contracts executed between regional stewardship committees making recommendations for slot allocation by December 1st and ELD reviewing recommendations comparing with RFAs making decisions to award funding by January 15th, especially with the holidays. A very fair <laughs> assessment of the situation we're working with um, our friends at program and procurement. Um, to exactly figure out what that RFA process timeline would be to be able to fit into this overall um, timeline as well. Uh, so we share um, those concerns as well, Sky. Um, when would the timeline goal of executed provider grants become available to hubs? That also impacts being able to meet other aspects of the timeline. And I think, again, that's all in the overall process once we understand what the procurement situation is. Mm -hmm. um, Agree with Molly, yes, if there's, then here's a, another one. If there was a shared database, shared eligibility requirements, shared state forms that coordinate enrollment process and the work that comes before it, it would be more coordinated. Also a good comment. Um, yes, and in-home providers, the anxiety. Yes, we totally understand that. We've been just to let people know we're uh, in an internal um, review process right now. Um, of all the feedback and these issues and hopefully aligning our new um, uh, planning and goals to um, that feedback. So part of our kind of code design um, process here. So thank you for the good questions and we'll have some more time in our breakout groups to really um, get into some of these um, um, barriers and concerns um, and ways that things are working well. All right, Anne, I think we're ready to keep going. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for that. Um, I'm just gonna share this next slide. Um, gosh, I hope they're larger for you than they are for me. Um, so in 20, in December, 2020, um, uh, we had a partner directors meeting around coordinated enrollment that was facilitated by school readiness consulting. So um, hub directors who, uh, who are on this call may, uh, may or may not, depending on <laughs> where we all were presently in December, um, recall um, this meeting. Um, we had a visioning session and time around what success could look like for coordinated enrollment. Um, and School Readiness Consulting pulled out some of these key quotes from that time together. Um, so wanted to uh, have an opportunity to share that with you. These are from the um, Coordinated Enrollment Guidebook that School Readiness Consulting um, uh, wrote, um, and that is uh, was attached as well as the implementation plan. Um, so just wanted to see, um, you know, are these, does, do these still resonate um, with you all? Um, have have any have it, has anything changed around that you know relationship, um, or has anything changed since December? Which is a silly question to ask um, because of course it has. Um, but just in in reflecting back on um, some of our previous uh, ELD time together, um, would love to see are these resonant. Um, any anything you would add on or had something that has changed since since December on that front? And maybe I'll get a check. Are these are these readable? Should I try to read them out? <laughs> They're kind of tiny. They're okay. Okay, I see some thumbs up. I see some wrinkled faces. <laughs> so perhaps we've met the median <laughs> viewer. <laughs> Uh, 
I'll, I'll just chime in. Um, I think that the sentiment in these reflections, at least for me, are still relevant and valid. Um, I think that my experience over the last several years with enrollment um, is really with the implementation pieces and the compression of the timeline that happens um, because of procurement deadlines and timelines getting pushed out. And it's just, it's an accordion where things that happen at the state level, it just makes everything harder along the path. And not like I, and just to go back to that slide before, the timeline in and of itself is great if everything, all of those pieces existed in a vacuum, but because they don't, it just, it's like this trickle down effect where we start losing momentum because we don't hit one deadline or we get caught up because something is stuck at the state level or because the RFA process gets pushed out or because of, and then the legislation session comes and that gets eaten up with a lot of oxygen. So I just feels like I appreciate the planfulness of that and just want to caution against like, is is that timeline realistic? Like, I just feel like we're constantly setting ourselves up for frustration and failure. If we're really not providing adequate time for those activities that really meet reality. And so I, I totally agree with these meeting reflections. Like this is my wish too. Like definitely believe strong relationships help build the system. Definitely believe like it would be so awesome if a, a person who was getting ready to have a baby was able to just get plugged in and all of a sudden their path just gets cleared before them that their child goes from zero to kindergarten and yet I just we constantly get pushed up against the reality of um, crunching timelines and and running out of runway and then shit just starts to get messy and I mean it's like even this meeting today where it's like I want to be here fully present in my brain and really getting creative and talking about this and I've got like 15 other things going on where we're trying to enroll kids still in summer learning and getting ready for fall so I'm already like my blood pressure's up to here and I can't really think in a system level way because I'm too busy on the ground and I'm a hub director I'm just jumping in to help Michelle like this is we are like all hands on deck trying to get kids enrolled for fall and it's like we don't have a minute to breathe or even think about system level things and so I apologize for my fervor in this it's just my um I want to be a good thought partner and I want to be planful and mindful and I love the I'm a huge fan of timelines and planning and I feel like it just sets us up um, for failure if we don't really consider really truly what it takes in terms of time and capacity to achieve those goals. Standing down from my soapbox. Thanks. <laughs> Bess, I think you all reflect um, and from the chat box that I'm watching the feelings of um, most of the people on the call and also um, your staff at the ELD as well. And um, I just remind people that the issue that we're most up against as we have been continuing to build our fleet of planes all, all these many years is the, the legislature and the legislative timeline and our requirements to get things in place to be able to prove um, that we're effectively or at least doing things prior to the next session where we have to go back again and get another expansion. So I think I speak for all my colleagues in saying we too would um, like to have a lot more time and we understand the tightness of the timeline and we spend a lot of times wringing our hands as well. And I'm not making an excuse. I'm just saying like, we're with you. Um, on this, and it's not um, it's not for lack of wanting to have um, a, a more adequate timeline. I wish we could have taken a pause over COVID for a year and actually got you know got it together a little bit better. But unfortunately, we couldn't do that in order to go back to the session this time and get an expansion. So um, we're with you. We will try every which way we can, um, battling the procurement department, et cetera, um, on getting things um, in place. Um, appropriately and we'll make adjustments where, where we can. So I just I just want to um, say that this co-design thing that we're doing that's very special um, around the country, this is part of the issue that we're up against is really, frankly, I think the legislative timeline is probably our biggest our biggest problem that smushes us into these uh, into these situations from the first implementation of preschool promise as we all know. 
So I'll just say that. I'm going to check the chat box here. Thank you guys for your for your comments. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be awesome if we could figure out how to contract over years. I mean, what I would say is that hopefully... I mean, remember, we're really new in all of this. And so I know it's we're at a hard sausage making time, but hopefully in the next couple of years, as we start to get further along in our implementation and actually know what we're all doing, um, that will help to um, quell the situation. But I'd rather be in the situation where we have expansion and not in a place where we're looking at um, not, being, not being there. We have to make hay while the sun shines and that's the spot that we're in right now. So um, stick with us. We want to do this with you. We want your input. Um, and we also want to adjust the timeline um, appropriately um, as needed while also meeting the things that we can't adjust to, which is really that session in February. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think, yep. I like that, Lisa, about wondering if we should talk about next year, what expectations and dreams. I you know I love to have the, like, what's victory really look like? And then how do we back into that? And then what do we have to do this time around yet again to make it work um, in an accelerated, um, in accelerated timeline? And Molly, I hear you about the contracts. You, Jen Richter knows, because she had to check it with me yesterday, but I had to blow up with procurement yesterday. So I am, there is no more frustrated person <laughs> <laughs> the division than me about these situations. So I am with you all. Okay, Anne, yeah. let's move. On. I know we have so much to cover. <laughs> no, we do. And and this is great. I hope that this can um help move us into our, our small group discussion, which I'm hoping will be the the rest of this time uh mostly together. Um so what we have um for small group and we're gonna do a random assignment of these. So if you um don't see your uh colleagues in one of your sessions, it's because we've we've just dealt the deck. Um <laughs> uh so would really love to spend some time. We're gonna have um an ELD uh person uh, available as a facilitator for these, but would love to hear in your small group. Um what excites you about this plan. Um, appreciate um, what I've been hearing so far and just wanna make sure that we have time to, to hear more directly from everyone too. What are your wishes for the early learning system through coordinated enrollment? Um, what barriers do you see to accomplishing uh, the coordinated enrollment implementation plan? Um, and then I think really important to acknowledge that often we find the same barriers or experience similar ones. And um, it's important to see what's been tried um, to address that, um, whether whether successful or unsuccessful, you know, where can we um, continue this together? Um, and where has someone tried down a road that turned out to be a dead end? I think important to to know trying is a part of a part of this work as well. Um, so um, as I said, you'll have uh, an ELD person uh, facilitating. I'd like to ask the group to identify someone who's willing to report out before the end of uh, the session. We have, let's see, um, it's 9.50 now. Um, so if we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, in the small group time to talk through uh, these questions. Um, and then I'll reconvene us at about um, 10, 10 uh, to do a share out um, on, those, on those reflections as well. So sound good. Um, gonna make sure, let's see, I've got these copied. I'm gonna put them in the chat right now. So if anyone would like to be able to grab them and copy them into their own note-taking um, before we move to breakouts should be able to do that and bear with me while I while I figure out the breakout give me one second Okay, I think I think we should be good there. I'm going to go ahead and open all the rooms and you should zoom to a random room. See you all at 1010.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, can speak for my group. I know we had some real fruitful discussion. I'm excited to share back out with. Let's see. Um, maybe just popcorn style. Would anybody be willing to share their group discussions, some common areas or themes around their conversation? Sure. So uh, in my group, I had um, Alicia, Matt, Amy, and Kelly. And, you know, we talked, um, had a, a, a fair um, portion of the conversation was about things that were challenging. Um, so um, just feeling as if um, and, and uh, or feeling that um, feedback that has been provided has not necessarily been incorporated into some of the plans and that that um, erodes trust over time as well as the timelines eroding trust over time of um, uh, the ELD breaking timelines. So that was, um, it was nice to be able to hear, um, you know, what things we might be able to do to build um, to rebuild that trust. Um, and then we spent a good portion of time talking about um, a statewide, a need for a statewide data system and how um, that could really support coordinated enrollment and how being able to move um, child files um, kind of within county or within the state. So when families move that there's continuity of care. Um, and, you know, just a lot of opportunities that a statewide data system would provide for folks. Um, so, um, yeah, and then Kelly shared that she's had a, um, a really good experience with her coordinated enrollment folks and their interactions and connections with families and community and how that's um, just really uh, feeling really good after coordinated enrollment and how that that shift has kind of reinvigorated some um, uh, just like you know warmth and um, passion in the work um, and I, I didn't we didn't get to talk more about that so I'm interested to talk more about that but um, but that's uh, that was the that's kind of what happened in our group thanks thanks Lindsay really really good points raised there. Would another group like to share out? Sure, I could share out for um, my group. So we, we talked about a bunch of stuff and excuse me, I'm just kind of trying to give a, a broad overview of the notes that I didn't type up. Denise typed these up um, and they look great. Uh, but so the first bit that we talked about was a little bit about um, a barrier coordinating with Head Start in terms of their, their, they have to be pretty concerned about the feds and filling their spots because I guess if they don't fill their spots, they're just taken um, and the feds aren't super, super uh, concerned or at all concerned about um, their work with hubs and kind of how that might impact them filling their slots. Uh, they just get taken kind of regardless of that effort. Um, we have facilities as a barrier. So uh, where buildings are located in terms of preschool promise and Head Start um, in terms of geographical areas. Uh, another barrier we chatted about was the differences between eligibility requirements for Head Start and preschool promise and EIECSEs as well. So just kind of a lot of different systems at play. So it's it's tough to work together when all those systems have very separate, very strict, different rules to go by. Um, oh, I talked a little bit about um, the lack of a solid ROI to pass around, um, you know, not just, I guess the ROI we have right now is allows us to pass on the the ELD part of the application, but not the hub specific questions or even the eligibility documents. So that's a really tough barrier for coordination. Um, we did have somebody, and I'm so sorry, I think it's South Central. Jessica, are you in South Central? I see a nod from Denise. Um, so over in South Central, South it sounds, <laughs> go ahead. South Coast, Michelle. South Coast, thank yeah. you, South Coast. Um, it sounds like they're sharing a database with Head Start and 
also adopting a Head Start ROI that allows for that sharing um, that we just don't have here in Lane, and we're also not sharing a database. So lots of chat about a database like the last group, um, how that would be super handy and is handy when it is used already. Um, and then, yeah, I think that broadly covers our conversation. Sorry if I missed anything, everyone. Another group, definitely hear a lot of resonance with database with um, re eligibility requirements in different programs as barriers, yeah. I can go next. Um, I'm using Anne's notes, so thank you, Anne, for summarizing. Um, I tried to kind of group things by some themes. Um, so for our... Um, what excites us or what, what um, uh, yeah, what excites us about this vision. Um, some of the things that were shared, uh, the consistent stability financially that Preschool Promise can give to uh, small businesses and help them stay sustainable even through the pandemic was shared. Um, the family experience survey, being able to solicit feedback and hear um, their insights so that we can continually improve uh, the experience for them and let them know that we care about the, that experience. Um, again, that we have, um, this ties into this larger point that many of us made about how we like that the implementation plan um, is so family focused and, and the idea that there's one door to all of these programs and opportunities. And then um, of course that the challenge is how do we actually achieve that goal? How do we actually get there? Um, and um, similar to other groups, how do we get buy-in from partners um, to, to aim at that same goal um, and achieve it? Um, although, you know, we do have good baselines established in, with relations, relationships with partners, there's a long way to go. Um, and then, so the second half of our time, we, you know, sort of turn to some of those barriers, a lot of, um, a lot having to do with collaboration with Head Start. Uh, we talked about how there's a real need for high or state level uh, work uh, and collaboration with Head Start um, to then push out to hubs and Head Starts in regions. Um, so if there's going to be a shared application or interest form or shared eligibility or shared waiting list or shared data system, that that would have to come from the state, from um, a more centralized place uh, so that um, hubs and uh, Head Start OPK partners don't have the necessarily the all the responsibility for creating all of those shared systems uh, all across the state, but it kind of is worked out uh, from above. Um, we talked about the MOU, that that's actually a Head Start requirement, um, and so maybe that belongs more in there. Um, purview uh, to, to create the, to set up that MOU with hubs rather than the other way around. Uh, we talk about how this, you know, relationship building takes time and there's a lot of misperceptions and lack of awareness um, or assumptions made about the other programs. And so it's just going to take, just going to take time to keep meeting and talking and trying to work these things out. Um, and that again, the ELD could help to, um, although not at the federal level, obviously, but maybe uh, at least for state funds to help uh, reassure programs that they um, are required to or, or will be um, rewarded for collaborating and making referrals rather than feeling like they, that scarcity where they have to hoard wait lists and not share information because they're so worried about not filling their slots that we take more of that um, broad family-centered approach, um, a regional approach rather than a programmatic one. So. Thanks, Kai. And let's see, we have one more group, I believe. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kick off for room three um, in, in our group, and then I'll see if anybody else wants to join in. I think some of our biggest takeaways in our conversations is really the importance of um, the, the foundation of relationships for this work, and that um, in being family-centered, uh, and that that 
those relationships are really important and especially the relationships with the grantees on the ground are also really important and the things that can create barriers to those relationships um, is sort of um, what I would say was being that middle person in between the state system which is, um, I think Molly put it really well when she said it's a transactional system, not a relationship-based system, which I think we've encountered uh, uh, more than a few times. Uh, and um, the relationship between the hubs and the coordinators and the programs and families is definitely relationship and, and centered, not transactional. And so how that how that can create challenges around trust building, how that can create challenges around communication flow, and um, how um, that can create some additional pressure um, to best represent both sides. And I think that there was also some expressed excitement about also the possibilities within that and some optimism um, around expansion and some optimism around continuing to build that, that trust um, and some of our smaller regions that are already building wait lists for some programs uh, and, and hoping that, that the expansion will be able to support that as well. Uh, so I don't know if Molly, Michelle, Antonia, or any of the others that were in that group will have anything they'd like to share. Athena was also in that group. No, I think you you did a good job sharing what we discussed. Thank you. Great, thank you all. Um, well, I'm seeing we are just about at time. I want to be respectful of that as well. Um, on the uh, in the vein, I think of that relationship building, also sort of understanding where you know ELD um, can support and and encourage um, those partnerships a bit more. We are holding um, uh, si similar sessions uh, with uh, OPK directors and with CCRNR directors uh, tomorrow um, to also hear their reflections here. Um, you know, really the intent around calling out our, our big system partners in uh, this work together to say um, it takes work and it takes a I don't know two two way relationship, but there's multiple two ways of this all, and and how do we come into circle <laughs> together? I guess if I'm trying to use shapes um, to uh, demonstrate this, um, those are uh, some just immediate on the on the forefront. So I encourage you, if you, I'm sure you were already in conversation with your partners locally, um, but just know that that this uh, similar time is going to be spent tomorrow um, with those director groups as well. Um, uh, just really reflect on a lot of the commonality across across your experiences and your feedback around data systems, around where we can best um, move towards uh, supporting coordination from a state level that really allows for those that trust to build um, the, you know, reliance that we're all having the same information and that we're able to come into closer partnerships that do take time to develop um, around enrollment, which can feel like a scarcity model, particularly coming out of a, um, a challenging year in a pandemic where families weren't enrolling the ways they have in the past. Um, uh, so we'll continue to look for times and opportunities to bring folks together um, in the guise of you know coordinated enrollment, the key activities timeline, um, as as a as a goal, and really starting to work on what this looks like in practice for this year, how close we get to that goal, with I think acknowledging the commitments of timeline um, and that accordion metaphor. I, I want to hold on to that um, as the ways that our challenges, be they legislative procurement. Um, do compress and ultimately affect your relationships and communities, which ultimately affect children and families' experiences in the early learning system. So um, do want to acknowledge that's something that's very much on the minds um, as we're talking about expansion timelines and um, a shift towards something that um, is more family-centered in approach. Um, and that while I am sure we will not hit it out of the park this first go round, but we are in that same circle of continuous quality improvement um, as we go. So please 
don't hesitate to reach out. Any other feedback that you'd like to share with me um, or with my colleagues as well throughout this, um, please don't hesitate to do so and really appreciate you all taking the time today um, to reflect and share this feedback with us for many of you yet again. Um, so I, I really do appreciate your time uh, in doing that and we will be very closely in touch soon, I'm sure. Thank you all so much. Take care, everyone.